God's Word. If you guys want to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, we're going to cover quite a bit of Scripture. We're going to go from verse 12 all the way to chapter 4, verse 1. Let's read our Word, and, uh, or God's Word, and then we'll pray for our service and our, our tithes and offerings this morning. Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 says, Now, not that I have already attained or obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have I have often told you, and now tell you, eat with tears. Walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Chapter 4. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy, my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. This is God's word. Let's pray. Jesus, we, we come before you humble. We come before you knowing that you are the God of all things, knowing that you alone have the power to subdue all things under your control, even death. Lord, possibly our greatest fear. Lord, you have put death under your control. And so Jesus, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would humbly speak to, or that we would humbly come before you and you would speak to our hearts. We, we pray, Lord, that we would submit to your word this morning, and it's in Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week, we looked at Paul's letter to the Ephesian church, and he encouraged them to live to the call to which they had been called. And as we teased out this calling, we saw that God's calling for us was to walk in, for uh, his calling for us to walk in was a calling to right living, to righteous living in light of the gospel. And we saw this being worked out in the way of living in unity with one another, working in ministry with one another, and maturing with one another. And if I may say, I was incredibly blessed and, and encouraged that after that, after, that, uh, after that teaching last week, many of you reached out either text and through email and said, let's go. And so I'm very encouraged by that church that, that we have a church that's ready to do the work of the ministry to unite with one another, to, to, to work alongside one another in the ministry and to help, each, help spur each other along in the maturity in, in our relationship with the Lord. And so this week, we're going to pick up kind of where we left off and look at what that maturing may look like. So the title of my sermon this morning is, How Then Shall We Live? How then shall we live in light of the gospel of Jesus? And I want to begin by putting into practice a common Bible study tool that we use when we approach scripture. 
Sometimes it's helpful for us to start at the end and kind of work our way backwards. This is often helpful when, helpful when reading Jewish letters and is certainly true of the style that Paul likes to write in. In his letters, Paul likes to, likes to address a problem. He sees the problem. He addresses the problem. And then layer by layer builds a case and points to the solution. And for our modern ears, we're often trained in the opposite direction. We're often trained to, to be presented with the solution, and then here's why this makes the most sense. And to be clear, I don't want to take, take from or augment God's word in this process, but we are expositing God's word, which is just a fancy way of saying explaining God's word, the text to receive the fullness of what the text is saying. So starting in chapter 4, verse 1, we see yet another therefore. And as I mentioned last week, we ask ourselves, whenever we come across a therefore, we ask ourselves, what is that therefore, therefore? And Paul pleads, Paul's plea with us is to stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Paul's answer is, to the question of the title of our sermon, how then shall we live, is this. Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. And so if we are following what the scripture is saying, we can see that maturity will result in our ability to be firm in our beliefs, to stand firm, to be able to stand upright and not be swayed by the various lies of the world. A lot of what we looked at last week. And for those of us who are parents, we remember helping our children to walk for the first time, right? It doesn't really begin with them standing up or holding their hand while they try to put one foot in front of the other. But it begins with them rolling over for the first time. Them being on their back or their side and then flipping over. You guys remember the, that, that time? Isn't that just a sweet time when they start to move all by themselves? And from that, from that rolling over moves to sitting up and then from sitting up to crawling and then crawling to pulling themselves up or pulling things down often, right? And then from there, after pulling themselves up on things, they begin to let go of the structure or the hands that have been holding them steady and then they start to venture out on their own. I remember this almost as if it was yesterday, 15 years ago, when my, when my oldest daughter, Eden, took her first steps. And right after she took her first steps and we all cheered, my dad looked at me and said, next thing you know, she's going to be saying, but daddy, I love him, and be driving off in her car. <laughs> Thanks, dad. Killjoy. This was a great moment and you ruined it. But I'm struck with the reality that that was 15 years ago. And my little girl is doing way more than standing up and walking. In fact, she's getting ready to apply for her first job. And she's getting ready to pay for said first car. And venture out on this world of independence. And I'm scared. <laughs> right? Some of you guys have been there. And you guys know that feeling. It's a scary thing to venture out on your own. But Paul approaches this idea of maturity in this section by offering helpful methods of maturing. And, and those three methods are pressing, imitating, and gazing. Pressing, imitating, and gazing. And so first we look at pressing in verse 12 through 16. Paul takes some time to assess the past in saying, not that I have already obtained, the present in saying, I press on, and the future by saying, to make it my own. Not that, have I, not that I have already obtained, I press on to make it my own. And my first point is this, maturity in Christ is recognizing where we were, where we are, and then choosing to press on towards the end goal or the prize. What's interesting in this text is this word press on. 
And yes, I did say this word, press on, because in the original language of the letter, our English two words, press on, is actually one word in the Greek. And even more interesting, it's the same word used in verse 6 of this chapter. Let's read it and let's see if you guys can pick out which word this is. In verse 6 it says, As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness, under the law, blameless. Now the interesting thing here is that same word that we use for press on is not zeal. It's actually persecute. The same word in the Greek used for persecute is the same word that Paul uses for press on. This word means to pursue, to run after, to run swiftly as one does in a race. In using this word, Paul is giving us this example of a life of repentance and change. He can use the exact same word at one point that Paul ran towards the destruction of the church of Jesus and any knowledge of Jesus or any followers of Jesus. But now Paul runs toward knowing Jesus more and the building up of the church of Jesus. It's the same word. Paul now focuses his attention on knowing Jesus on the knowing of Jesus and the actively putting behind himself who he was in the past and presently choose, choosing to actively pursue maturity or maturity in Jesus. He is running for the prize. Now, how I read this text, it seems like Paul is saying that the prize is actually the call itself. The prize that we are running towards is actually the call itself. Another mark of maturity is is this race finishing mindset where our eyes are fixed on Jesus and not distracted by the things of this world. I'll say that again because that's my second point of this section. Another mark of maturity is this race finishing mindset where our eyes are fixed on Jesus and not distracted by the things of this world. This race is about knowing and doing. Knowing God and doing his will or living on or living in his mission. And in verse 15, Paul even mentions that he trusts God to clear up the things that we can't learn or know or things that we may disagree on, but he also encourages us to hold true or hold fast to the things that we do know or the things that are true. And this is true of a lot of areas of life. When math problems are hard for my kids, I encourage them to go back to the things that we know. Go back to the basics and the fundamentals of the things that we can agree on when we look at this problem and then move forward from there. When life is hard or life is confusing, a practice to implement is to remind ourselves that we, of what we know to be true and holding fast to those things. I, 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 often, I often give this example where when my life is, is crazy, I feel like I went from a cruise ship to a canoe, and I'm trying to stand up. You can stand up and walk around on a cruise ship without any problem, right? Why? Because it's steady. It's big. The, the, the chop of the waves isn't really messing with it all that much, and we can walk around in comfortability. But has anybody ever tried to stand up in a canoe? It doesn't last very long, does it? You don't get very far unless you've got crazy core strength and balance. It's very, very difficult very, very difficult. But we can, when life gets crazy and when life gets hard, we can put this into practice where we can take a step back and we can analyze the things that are true, such as God is love. When this world is going crazy, I know that God is in control. In the midst of the storm, I know that the sun hasn't disappeared entirely, but God is present in our time of need. Part of unity, like we talked about last week, is choosing to focus on what we know is true. The pressures of this world should push us together as a church and not pull us apart. Amen? 
The pressures of this world should not pull us apart, but the pressures of this world should push us together. In the call to maturity, Paul encourages us to press on in the knowing and the doing. And in our next section, he points us to imitating himself as well as others in verse 17 through 19. Let's look at that and let's read that. It says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have told you that told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame. With minds set on earthly things. This call to imitate for Paul is not said from a heart of arrogance. Paul is not saying, I've got it all together, follow me. But he's saying, I have fixed my eyes on Jesus and he is our plumb line. He is what we are all aiming for. And if I've got my fix, if I've got my eyes fixed on him, follow me and let's go. Remember with me earlier in this chapter, as we studied quite a few weeks back, after Paul lists out all of his, all of the privilege, all of the privileges that he was born into and, and, and achieved in his life. But then we come to verse 7 of chapter 3. Let's read this, 7 through 9, that says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. You see, Paul's, Paul is confident in what he believes. He didn't, if you remember back at his conversion in the book of Acts, he did not rush into ministry right after his conversion, but took years to build his understanding of Jesus. And from that time of spending with Jesus, founding, founding his, his belief in the gospel, Paul can confidently say, follow me as I am following Christ. This isn't a do as I say, not as I do situation either. Nor is Paul asking for the church to put their faith and their trust in him and his ability. But as a good leader does, fixes his eyes on the call and the goal and tells those following, let's go. Paul knew he wasn't the best or the only one to follow. Paul knew he wasn't the only pattern to follow, which is why he says, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. But then in verse 18 and 19, we see the contrary. In verse 18 and 19, we see the contrary. We see those, he he describes those who walk as an enemy of the cross. For many of whom I have told you, And now tell you with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. To walk as an enemy of the cross of Christ is to be actively against the power of the cross. To walk as an enemy of the cross of Christ is to be actively against the power of the cross. We have to remember that Paul... And the whole of this chapter is calling us to share in the cross of Christ. That part of being a Christian is to take part in death to self, to repentance and conversion. The enemy of the cross is someone who believes in salvation without the need for repentance or the change of allegiance. This is as if This is as if someone who gets married and then continues to date others and refuses to leave behind the single mindset and way of living. And we see something here that we don't hardly ever see out of Paul, the apostle, and that is a tearful emotion 
towards the enemies of the cross. Charles Spurgeon says this of the section. He says, I never read that the apostle wept when he was persecuted. Though they plowed his back with furrows, I do believe that never a tear was seen to gush from his eye. While the soldiers scourged him, though he was cast into prison, we read of his singing, never his groaning. I do not believe he ever wept on account of the sufferings or dangers to which he himself was exposed for Christ's sake. I call this an extraordinary sorrow because the man who wept was no soft piece of sentiment and seldom shed a tear even under grievous trials. He then goes on to admonish the church leaders by saying this, professors of religion who get into the church and yet lead ungodly lives are the worst enemies that the cross of Christ has. Wow. Wow. These are the sort of men who bring tears to the minister's eyes. These are they who break his heart. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ. That's heavy stuff. The old Spurge is not holding anything back, is he? The end of this way of living is not life, but destruction. The word belly that Paul uses here is representing a broader reference to all indulgences, all, so, uh, all sensual indulgences, the living for the, for the pleasures of the body, mind, and soul. It's easy for us to cross this line of enjoying the pleasures of this world that God calls us to enjoy the pleasures of this world. But there's a, it's easy for us to cross the line of enjoying the pleasures and then living for the pleasures of this world. They glory in the things they should be ashamed of. And their focus is not worshiping God, but more to get along with the world. As Christians... We cannot be in good standing with a holy God while also being in equal good standing with a sinful world. Our allegiance as Christians has to shift from the glory of the world to the glory of God. Amen? As Christians, our allegiance has to shift from from focusing or our, our, our aim as being getting glory from the world to glorifying God. This doesn't mean we have to avoid the pleasures of this world. Praise God. Amen. We, do not, we don't have to avoid the pleasures of this world, but we have to recognize them not as king, but as a gift from our new king. Which brings us to our next section gazing and fixing our eyes on Jesus as our Savior. Verse 21, or 20 through 21. And I, I want to pause here and, to, to remember and then offer some context that is going to speak to the entirety of this letter of Philippians. It's also going to speak to the text that we're covering, to, covering today. And it's also going to speak to really specifically these two verses. In 42 BC, about 100 years before Paul's arrival, Rome went through their own civil war at following the death of Julius Caesar. So all of you history buffs, please correct me if I get anything wrong. This is something that, that I looked up and, and I found incredibly, uh, incredibly interesting. So right after the death of Julius Caesar, uh, Rome went into its own civil war. And the victorious generals of this war, Antony and Octavian, Octavian who would later become the Emperor Augustus, settled in or around Philippi and established Philippi as a colony of Rome. So Philippi was established as a colony of Rome. And through the following years, many, many more generals and veterans of Rome would essentially retire there. It became kind of a veteran retirement community in Philippi. 
And so by the, to- by the time that Paul had arrived there, there had been at least two to three generations of dedicated Roman colonists living there, benefiting from the wealth and close proximity to Rome. It was just a, a really quick boat ride from Philippi to Rome. And so they were very close They had the protection and all of the benefits of being a colony of Rome, but not actually being in Rome. And so the Philippian colonists tried to order their life around the culture that Rome had established, including something called the imperial cult, which meant Caesar or the emperor was to be worshipped as savior and lord. This was part of the culture that was built into Rome. And because Philippi was a Roman colony, they brought that culture or those beliefs into their culture themselves as a colony. And this is incredibly important to understand because now let's read verse 20. He says this, But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await, everybody read this with me, a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Single-handedly, in one sentence, Paul is refuting the culture and the belief of the entire colony. Because that colony looked as, at Caesar as their savior and their Lord. In fact, there's some his, uh, historians that found coins that's, that say Caesar, Savior, and Lord from that time frame. This is what they believed. And so now having this context and reading this verse, we begin to see the weight that it had on the original Philippian church, as well as the weight that it has on us today. To be a citizen of Rome and Philippi didn't mean that they were looking forward to living in Rome. Being an established colony of Rome actually worked the opposite way. Their citizenship was their call to live out Roman culture where they were presently and expand from there. You guys tracking with me? As Roman citizens and as Roman citizens living in a Roman colony, their their goal was not to eventually get to and live in Rome but to be present where they were, live out Roman culture, and then expand that Roman culture from Philippi onwards. But when things went wrong in the colony, they could call upon their quote-unquote savior, emperor, emperor, to come in and save them and rule over their enemies. This is important. The church today is a colony of heaven and we are citizens of Jesus. The church today, where we are at right now, is a colony of heaven and we are citizens of heaven. Amen? We are citizens of of Jesus' heavenly kingdom where he is our Lord and he is our Savior. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Savior. The question we can ask ourselves today is this. Do we believe that we serve a better Savior and Lord than Caesar? And this was the question that Paul was, without asking it, Paul was inferring and hoping that the Philippians would ask themselves. Do we truly believe that while we live here in Philippi, that we are actually citizens of heaven? And that our true Lord and Savior is a man called Jesus. And not only is he a man, but he's also God. And he is our Savior. Church, Caesar is dead. That rule is over. Rome fell. Rome tried to stamp out the establishment of Christianity. And they failed. Rome tried to stamp out the establishment of Christianity and the Christian church, and they failed. Read with me 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. Speaking to this idea of the world trying to stamp out Christianity, 
Paul says this to the Corinthian church. In verse 7 through 12, he says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that that, so that that, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Speaking of our bodies, read with me verse 21 back in our text in Philippians. Who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that it enables him even to subject all things to himself. Our bodies, even the weakest parts of us, will be redeemed by Jesus. And everybody says amen. Right? Who here is tired? Right? Who here feels like our bodies are broken down and failing? We're tired. We get sick. My family's getting sick right now. My, my poor wife is home with our kids that are just not feeling well and it's, 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 it's not going great. Please pray for my kids. They're, 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 they're not feeling too great. But as a human race, we are all fading away. And there's no serum, there's no makeup or fitness routine that will stop the imminent breaking down of our bodies. There's just not. And this sounds depressing for those who are not in Christ, but for those who are in Christ, we have this hope that this body is just a tent. Right? And tents are what? Temporary. This is just temporary. We have our eternal glorified bodies to look forward to. Let's continue in 2 Corinthians 4, 13 through 18, where it says, Since we have the same spirit of faith, According to what has been written, I believe, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord, the Lord Jesus, that was a joke from last week because I accidentally said Lord, raised the, the, now I can't not say it, darn it. He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, church. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are are eternal. Quick pause. Paul in saying this, and when he says, for this light momentary affliction, I just want to speak to you guys as, as, as your pastor. As somebody who loves you guys, I've, I see your guys' faces. Every time I'm up here either doing worship or I'm teaching, I like to look out and, and Try to make eye contact with each and every one of you because I love you guys and you guys have souls and you guys are the body of Christ. And I know that every single person in this place goes through their own various struggles and their own trials. This life is not easy. Church, I've had one of the hardest weeks this last week. Up until Wednesday, I had about 7,000 steps on my phone. 
Because all I did was sit in meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting for three days. It was hard. And this verse, when he says for this light momentary affliction, church, hear me. Paul is not dismissing your pain. Nor is God dismissing your pain. God is not invalidating what you are going through. But when we take those things, and I'm not even going to compare it to what Paul has been through. Paul went through a lot. That's okay. That, 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 that was Paul. But I'm talking to us for right now. What, what you guys are going through and what I'm going through is not invalidated, but in light of the eternity that we will spend with God, this life is just a blip. It's, it's, it's just short. It's so short. And even, even the pain and the hardship that we endure in this life is even shorter than that. Because it's just momentary. It's momentary. It doesn't invalidate the extensiveness or the hurtfulness of the pain that you are going through in this life. But it says that if we fix our eyes on Jesus, this pain and, and, and we, we, we gain a patience that we could never attain in and of ourselves without Jesus. And so our application this morning, getting back to my notes, that was a quick little step away and exhort you guys as the church. Our, our application this morning is found then in where we started this morning. In verse four, or chapter four, verse one, it says, therefore, let's read it again. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Everybody read this with me. Stand firm. No, that's you guys is called to like read out loud with me. Here we go. Every, we're going to read it out loud because sometimes speaking things out of our mouth helps our hearts to believe it just a little bit more. Amen? Let's read this last part together, starting in stand firm. Ready? Go. Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm thus in the Lord. Is to live in the present in light of the future. To stand firm is to live in the present in light of the future. Living in the present is to live as a citizen of heaven where God has called us today. This is not a, I'm looking forward to anything, but I am actively today, presently living as a citizen of heaven. You are a citizen of heaven, living in a colony of heaven. The calling of the church colony, that's, that's fun, say that five times fast. The calling of the church colony is to shape our culture for Jesus. Our mission isn't always to convince people of the gospel, but it is to always live out the gospel. To love God and to love others as Christ has loved and, and has given himself up for us. Our, our culture is not built to be aware of the present right? Our culture is not built to be aware of the present. The pastors and myself are going through a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by, by a guy named John Mark Comer. And it has just been a fantastic book to go through as we have been a, as a staff and a, as, a, as, as a pastoral team, just kind of taking a step back. Let's analyze our lives and the busyness that this world tries to throw at us. And let's come alongside one another and encourage one another to just stop for a second. To just be still. And to be present in knowing that God is on the throne. And, and we, we actually put in a, uh, uh, an order for this book and it's going to be available if you guys want to read it. I highly suggest uh, that you guys read it. It's going to be available in the cafe. I was hoping to get it in by today. I don't think they came in, but you can talk with Daniel or anybody in the cafe and put your name down as a pre-order. And, if, uh, and once, those get, once those books come in, we can, we can give them to you and you can make a uh, suggested donation towards the cafe. But something we were finding out is that there is no time to stop or to take a breath and to look at the beauty of the world around us. 
To push pause on our social media life is to not be informed of all the things going on. And quite honestly, we might not survive if we push pause on our social media. That was said tongue in cheek. I'm being incredibly sarcastic. (laughs) My wife has to remind me, change your face. If you're going to be sarcastic, you have to like smile and smirk so people know you're joking. (laughs) Sorry. In church, we for to push pause on our social media is, is we, we often feel this sense of FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. That's, it's a term that has been given to the social media culture. That if we are away from our phones or if we unplug from our phones for a little bit, there's this anxiety that builds up in us and, it's, it, and they're calling it FOMO. The fear of missing out. The fear of missing out on What? The fear of missing out on what? Church, remember, we forget that the platform for our smartphones that we use today was only, is only 15 years old. It came out the same year, the iPhone came out the same year my daughter was born. 15 years old. And we've so bought into this way of life that we find ourselves asking the most stupidest questions. Like this past week, we were FaceTiming with a friend of mine and he told me that he doesn't take his phone into the bathroom with him, which I immediately responded with, then what do you even do in there? <laughs> Probably what they did for the last thousands of years prior to 15 years ago. But we've so bought in into this way of culture that, that it's, it's just, and, and, we've, and we've bought into it so fast. We've bought into it so fast, church. I mean, sometimes some medicine isn't even approved in 15 years. But we've so bought into this, this culture and this mindset. But the problem is, church, our connectedness today gives us the impression of being present culturally, but it's at the expense of being present in our identity. The trade-off is that we are being present culturally and we are aware of the things around us, but I'm telling you, church, it's at the expense of you forgetting who you are in Christ. Social media... And not just social media, but any type of media, any type of marketing that we see in our world is is an attempt at making you believe that you are owed something that you don't have. Our culture strives to put what others have over what you have, which makes us constantly what? Constantly wanting constantly wanting more and we forget who we truly are. It strives to put the American kingdom above the kingdom of Jesus. It strives to put the things and the keeping up kingdom above the kingdom of Jesus. It wants to show you all the things that you don't have. It wants to show you all of the things that you could get if you just, what? Worked a little harder. If I could only have this house, then I could have those Joanna Gaines shiplap walls and everything would be perfect, right? If only we could rip down this wall and they make it so easy, right? They make it so easy and it's like, why can't I attain that? I'm... Try and swing a hammer and it's not coming down the way that chip makes it come down. And then we, and then we, try, to, we, we try to build our lives and our, and, our, and our houses around this idea that, that it, it never will and it was never meant to. And then it gets us into some deeper waters where we start looking at other people's spouses and we think, oh man, I wish my spouse would do this. I wish my spouse would do that. I wish they'd look like this or I wish they'd look like that. I wish they could dress this way or I wish I could dress this way. I'm looking at these, at, at these guys in these, you know, fitness pictures or whatever and I'm like, man, that would be awesome. Instead of just being content with knowing that God loves me. Instead of being content with recognizing that, man, God has a will for my life and he has made me a citizen of heaven. 
And this even creeps into our spiritual life, right? We, hear, we, we, we read about these guys that are waking up at four o'clock in the morning and praying. We read about, or, or we see, or we, um, let, let's, let's be totally true and, and, and totally real. We look at pastors and we think, those guys, they've got it all together. That's what I want to be like. I want to be a pastor. Maybe the next best thing for me and my step and my relationship with the Lord is to become a pastor. And I'm t- like, people that come and ask me and, or tell me that they want to be a pastor, my first question is, why would you ever do that? Why would you ever want to do that? God loves you and God has given you identity an identity right where you're at, church. God saved you. God saved you. He loves you. He loves you so much. Church, would you hear that today? Would you hear that? Jesus loves you so much, not for you to become a pastor. No, he he loved you just where you're at. And he died for you to be a plumber, to be a carpenter, to be a graphic designer, to be an electrician, to be a homemaker to be a wife, to be a husband, to be a child of God. Church, hear me. That's enough. This idea of knowing and doing, I'm going completely off script because I feel the, the Holy Spirit wanting me to say this. The idea of knowing and doing is all built into and interwoven into the, this, this being a citizen of heaven. Knowing who Jesus is. Knowing that he, that, that he loves you. That he sent his son to die for you. That you may know him more. And that you may also know that he has created you wonderfully in his image. In his image, church. Hear that. He's created you in his image. And then, despite your past, despite all the things that, that, that you have done or you have seen or things that have been done to you, he chose you to be his child. He chose you to be his child. That you may not just be a citizen. Yes, you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven but you are also his child. He chose you. He chose you to be his own. Can we just sit in that? Can we glory in that? Church, would you close your eyes with me just for for a hot second? Let me just pray over you. Nathaniel's gonna come up and and lead us in a time of responsive worship. But for right now, I just, this is not in my notes. This is just completely off the cuff. Like, can we just close our eyes? And can we ask the Holy Spirit to remind us of who we are in him? This isn't a self-help This is not a, all right, here we go, church. Let's go, go forward. I mean, yes, it is that. I want it to be that. But this this isn't to make us feel better about ourselves. This is just for us to recognize that the God of the universe loved you so much that he gave his life for you. And the stepping into the here and now to being in the present is to be completely aware of the future that we have in him. To recognize that the pains of this world, the hurts of this world, 
are just momentary. Let me read this scripture as you guys' eyes are closed. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would just minister to your hearts. Colossians 3, 1 through 17 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the, after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy, and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. And whatever you do, church, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. And so in our time of worship, church, let's come before the Lord. Let's ask for both forgiveness where we have fallen short, knowing, knowing in faith that God is able to forgive. Then let's ask the Holy Spirit's help Ask him to speak to you and to show you where repentance is needed. Ask him to remind you of the power that dwells in you. Ask him to remind you that you are a citizen of heaven. And our calling is to where we are right now.